Hello everyone and welcome to The Red Path. I am Dara and today we are going to be talking all about how to start collecting world leaders. So grab yourselves a brew and let's dive into the video. Okay, welcome back everyone. So in today's video, we are going to be going into how to start collecting world leaders, a topic that many people are wondering now that we have our own brand new codex. So we are gonna be talking about the lore, the hobby, and the gaming side of collecting world leaders. What are the best reasons to get into this wonderful army and following that, what is the best advice for moving along with your connection? So. Let's begin with why you would actually start to collect world leaders from a lore standpoint. So in the lore, the world leaders are one of the many Chaos Space Marine legions that have devoted themselves to Korn. So they kind of appear as this one dimensional and comedic army on the surface, you know, kind of like, haha, look at the funny Korn men running into combat all the time. But when you dive into it, they actually have quite a tragic fall to chaos. Now, I don't want to get into it for anyone who isn't already aware, but um, their story and the kind of reasons behind their corruption, it's actually very, very interesting and tragic once you kind of dive into the deeper side of things. They have lots of interesting characters in their legion as well, especially in Horus Heresy, characters um, like Karn, you know, the very famous Karn the Betrayer who exists in 40k. There's Delvaris as well, captain of the Triari and Lotara Sarn, the famous captain of the Conqueror flagship. So the lore is full of very compelling and, and fun characters to engage with as well, which makes them an interesting army to collect from that point. They have a very, very extensive backstory. You know, they are one of the keystone legions in the game. So they tend to have an awful lot of books written about them. And they're very, very easy to customize and homebrew. The nature of the army is that it is splintered into many different and separate warbands, meaning that it is very accessible if you want to create your own little warband with its own little story. Very, very easy to customize and homebrew that. So why would you collect world leaders from a painting and hobbying perspective, which is something that I'm sure an awful lot of people are wondering. So the wonderful thing about world leaders is that they're very easy to paint or very challenging depending on your chosen scheme so depending on what you actually want to get out of the army you can pick a scheme that is going to be very very easy and very quick to do but if you want to push yourself if you want something that is going to be a lot harder there is options for that as well so there's also lots of different options for kit bashing converting and customization the army kind of has that space marine canvas which means that there's lots of different parts that are going to be compatible with it it works with the vast majority of the new chaos space marine range as well and there is a wealth of options online for adding in spare bits and pieces you only have to google world leader berserkers and you will see a million different types of conversions and kit bashes not to mention all the people that make use of the wonderful age of sigma range for a variety of different units too there is an awful lot of scope to skill up with the hobby as well if you're collecting world leaders so I've used world leaders as a canvas to learn an awful lot of new techniques, including grimdark weathering, how to do really nice blood effects, and how to do OSL. Now, a lot of these things would kind of come with collecting any space marine army, but things like weathering and blood effects, they really show through on the world leaders who tend not to clean their gear much, if often, at all. So you can really kind of use that as a way of learning these new techniques where you might not have had the opportunity to before. Not to mention the fact that all of the new sculpts have just come out, so they're very easy to build, very easy to paint. They're very, very fresh and look amazing. So why would you collect world leaders from a gameplay perspective? Now, this is probably one of the more popular, I suppose, reasons as to why you might get into world leaders. Like, how do they feel on the table? How do they play? Well, you're going to want to start collecting world leaders if you're interested in playing a close combat army. And that seems very obvious on the surface, but world leaders, they do the close combat phase better than everyone else in the game, if you're not already aware. So you look to armies like um, Blood Angels or White Scars or any of the like, and no one really does close combat as hard as the world leaders. We spit out an awful lot of high quality, high damage attacks. And if you're the kind of person who enjoys 
rushing forward and getting into the blender zone world leaders are going to be the army for you also if you want to play fast games world leaders tend to play their turns very very quickly so if you're the kind of person who is worried about you know being a little bit on the slower side when it comes to actually playing the game world leaders are fantastic because they effectively cut out the entire psychic phase and most of the shooting phase they are operational in only movement and close combat now there is a lot of nuance to those phases but if you want to get through your games quickly, world leaders are a fantastic way of doing that. If you're looking for an army that is very easy to learn, very easy to get into, but then has actually got quite a high skill ceiling, it's very difficult to master. World leaders, again, fill this niche quite well because their skill floor is super low. Um, a lot of the units, they're kind of like what we call Ron Seal units. They do exactly what it says on the tin. You look at a Berserker data sheet and you say, hey, that thing blends in close combat has a cool little blood surge ability to get some extra movement but i'm pretty sure i can read that data sheet and say i know what it's going to do the vast majority of the time and you're, you'll be right like the army does kind of what you expect it to do most of the time but there are an awful lot of cool little tricks nice movement nuance nice things you can do in the fight phase to really make the army quite powerful and those are things that are going to come with time and with more experience with the army as well so it's very very easy to get into but if you want to take it to the absolute highest level it can be quite challenging so if you're into that kind of skill growth especially in the competitive side of things it's a brilliant army for that if you want to play an army that rewards good decision making and smart movement as well where leaders are the one for you also the flip side of that is true um, if you want to play an army that punishes you for making small mistakes especially mistakes in the movement phase then uh, yeah that that happens too with this army so they are very much based around understanding when to commit to a fight and also how much you're going to commit to a fight because they are a rather expensive army in a relative sense you know um, they feel very elite on the tabletop most of the time so you have to manage your resources really well and if you make the wrong decision at the wrong time a lot of your army can kind of fall apart and you can lose a game if you want very simple play patterns as well, you know, that don't particularly change in the meta sense, um, but kind of change in the micro sense between games. So they, they tend to be a very, very flexible army that can play reactively. They can play around what your opponent is planning rather than you having to have a set plan going into the game. They are really awesome for doing that as well. So they bring an awful lot of nuance to the tabletop, but they are also super easy to get into. And that's the main reason that you might want to collect world leaders from a gameplay perspective. So we're going to talk about something called the coordinate trinity now this is a combat concept that i kind of sort of came up with a little bit when i was thinking about what makes a good combat army and why the world leaders might slot into the coordinate trinity and where they fall in that so the coordinate trinity is made up of three different circles that overlap each other in this venn diagram here so we have speed damage and durability now these are three different aspects that can be associated with an army especially a combat army that's what we're looking at here Normally, when GW makes um, a combat army, they will encompass two of these three abilities, right? And there will be some overlap between them as well. So if we look at the likes of Custodes, right, they're extremely durable, highly elite, and they put out excellent damage. So they are going to fall somewhere between the durability and damage side of things. If we look at creations of Bile as they formerly were, they're an incredibly fast army and they had a lot of durability with all the Marcus Slanesh stuff, but they didn't really put out a massive amount of damage. So they're kind of falling into this category here between speed and durability. Then if we look at Harlequins as they used to be, they were a very, very damaging army that was incredibly fast, but were very, very elite as well. So they punished you if you made mistakes in the movement phase. So they kind of encompass that speed and damage aspect. So now we have to ask ourselves, where are world leaders currently? Well, the interesting thing is before our codex, we would have fallen into the durability and damage side of things where the custodes currently sit, because a lot of our builds revolved around things like red butchers or dreadnoughts or other fairly durable infantry types that could take a hit, but would put out an incredible amount of damage. But now with the inclusion of things like the eight bound, with the inclusion of Invocatus and Juggerlords for boosting movement and a host of stratagems that affect how we move and how fast we can go, we have actually ended up falling into a whole new category, which is the speed and damage category, because I think there are very few, if any, combat armies in the game that output as much damage as we do in the combat phase. And we are incredibly fast, especially in the Invocatus builds, being able to cross the whole board in the first turn of the game with his pre-game move 
or then you look at units like Angron who can move 16. So if you're the kind of person who wants to play a combat army that is highly mobile and does an incredible amount of damage when it hits, that's the world leaders. So that might be something that you are interested in. So all that's very good. Like it's great to kind of summarize the army in terms of its play style and in terms of what it'll be like to paint what it's like in the lore. That's a little bit of a preamble for all of you. But the question that you're all asking is how do I start collecting the world leaders? Where is my first port to call? What do I do to get into this faction? And that is a really good question. Something that many people have been asking around the internet on various forums, in discords, all that good stuff. So let's break it down. The first thing that we're going to look at is lore and supplies. And by supplies, I mean hobby supplies, the things that you're going to need to get into the world leaders. So let's talk a little bit about books. I've picked out a few keystone books here. They're mainly from the Horus Heresy, but they will give you a really good feeling for how the world leaders operate in the, the overall grand setting of Warhammer. So Angron Slave to Nysseria, this is a book about the Primarch Angron before he has become a demon Primarch. It is set in the Horus Heresy before the world leaders have actually converted to chaos. And it's a really interesting introspective look at Angron's life as a gladiator, as well as the reason why the world leaders took on the butcher's nails, the cybernetic implants that caused them to be the chaotic madman that we know and love. Then there is Karn, Eater of Worlds. This is an interesting story set in between Horus Heresy and Warhammer 40k during the scouring. And it's all about the reason why um, the Legion kind of splintered into all these smaller warbands. It's quite a short book, but it's pretty interesting as well. Lots of people really enjoy that one. And a lot of the book is set from Karn's perspective, our favorite space marine. Um, then we have Betrayer. Now, Betrayer is probably the fundamental world leader's book. If anyone asks like what book should i read to get an idea of what the world leaders are like it is betrayer this is said during the shadow crusade of the horus heresy when the word bearers and the world leaders were scouring all of ultramarar killing all the ultramarines there are some incredibly awesome scenes in this book and it really depicts the sort of tragic situation that the world leaders find themselves in and is an excellent primer for getting into the faction so let's talk a little bit about paints right because Picking up the right paints is always difficult for the task. Now, I've tried to slim down the list of paints. This isn't exactly the full list that I would use myself for any of these schemes, but it will be enough to get you off the ground and going. So let's look at the 40K scheme first, right? Which is the red and brass color scheme. So for your reds, you're probably gonna want a mix of Word Bearers Red, Mephiston Red, and Wild Rider Red. So there you've got a good foundational layer, which you can mix in with a strong layer, and then some nice highlights with Wild Rider Red. Then for the metallics, to get that nice bronze look, you're gonna start with a base coat of warp lock bronze, blend in some retributor armor, and finish it off with some touch highlights of canoptic alloy. Now there will obviously be all the belt pouches and all those things as well. Those are small little details that I'm not gonna dive too deeply into, but we do have a 40K painting scheme here on the Red Pass, so you can investigate that for yourself if you want to. But what about the 30K scheme, right? The white and blue, the thing that an awful lot of people tend to love and want to know how to paint. Well. I would start with two white paints, ceramite white and white scar. Now, ceramite white is a nice base coat. I think it's actually been relabeled to Corax white now. It's a strong base layer white to work up, but I like to mix it in with a brown, something like Baneblade brown, to really make a an off-white foundation layer. And then I'll typically highlight with something like white scar. And for those blues, you wanna build up with a mix of Night Lord's blue and Cantor blue, and kind of work in something maybe like Stegadon scale if you wanna have a little bit of an off-blue tone as well. Then for your bronze, you're going to be looking at Retributor Armor for your base coat, touching it off with a Canoptic Alloy highlight again. And if you want to hit the grimdark side of 30k World Leaders, we have a tutorial available here on the Red Path. And also we are streaming plenty of 30k grimdark schemes every week. So hop in for those too. But what about your first units? What are the main things that you want to buy when you start collecting World Leaders? Well, the Combat Patrol, which at time of filming has not yet been released but will be coming out soon, is a really good starting point for the world leaders. It contains a solid core of very relevant units that you will use in almost every single game of Warhammer 40,000. That is a bunch of Jackals, a bunch of Corn Berserkers, and a Juggernaut Lord or Invocatus, depending on which way you build him, to lead the whole thing up. So that's a really, really solid 
foundation level, right? It has the main unit that's going to be in all of your lists. The Corn Berserkers are standard troop choice. You've got some nice chaff with the Jackals in there as well. And you have a potentially very powerful character in the form of either Invocatus or a pretty decent character in the form of the Juggernaut Lord as well to head up that. You can never have too many Berserkers. So when you've built up your combat patrol, what do you want next? You're probably going to want even more Coordinate Berserkers. I never leave home with less than 20. Most people kind of hover around that mark anyway. So you kind of want to decide for yourself how many Berserkers are you going to have, at least initially in your lists. But let me tell you right now, once you start playing games, you're always going to want to have one or two more Berserker squads than you actually end up using. So getting more Berserkers will never be a bad idea. And you can have tons of fun kit bashing them to differentiate the units as well. Berserkers, of course, can't just walk around everywhere. They need a trusty steed to carry them into battle. And nothing is better than a good old-fashioned Rhino APC carrier, which is known and loved by every single World Eater player since the dawn of time. Now, of course, it is not the only option. If you are a more experienced hobbyist, there are resin options like the Terex Pondering and Termite Drill and the Dreadclaw Drop Pod as well. But if you are just getting into the faction, I recommend you start off with something nice and simple, pick a Rhino, and keep it nice and happy. 8-Bound then, they're a fun little supplement to the start of this core army that you've been building up. You know, they're kind of like a faster, bigger version of Berserkers. Basically, the way I would say it is like, imagine possessed Chaos Space Marines, but jacked up even more. They're super rapid, they'll hit into combat really, really hard, they'll typically blend everything they touch, and they're a really nice supplement to run alongside all the things that we've already talked about. They're also really simple to understand in terms of how they play on the table. They're not going to differ too much from the Berserkers and the Jackals that you've been getting used to. They're going to kind of function in the same role. And if you're feeling brave after all that, you could splash out with a demon engine of your choice because we have quite a few available to us. Now, lots of people will gravitate towards something like the Mauler Fiend to get go because it's an appealing looking, you know, big bruiser of a combat engine and it looks great on the battlefield. It's maybe not necessarily the most competitive choice, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't take it if you enjoy it. There's also really cool options like the Blood Slaughter from Forge World, one of my own personal favorites. But if you're not feeling demon engines, there's nothing wrong with a Hellbrute or a Contemptor Dreadnought as well. When you're bulking out to 2k points though, you need to think about what you're actually going to be adding in to make it a meaningful army. So we have this solid core that we've talked about, right? But you know, that's bringing you up to maybe 750, 1000 points, depending on how much you've invested. You're going to want some additional HQ support. Now, typically world leaders at the time of filming aren't too reliant on HQs, unless you're going for something like an Angron build, who tends to be the focal point of your army around which you will build. I wouldn't recommend starting the world leaders with Angron. He's a complicated model, he is a big, big centerpiece, and you want to get confident with the army before you invest in something like that. So once you have your solid core built up and painted, maybe treat yourself and invest in the Primarch, and he'll be a fantastic centerpiece. You'll also have kind of set down a scheme that you're happy with for painting, and you'll know how Angron's going to slot in with that then. Alternatively, if you haven't got Invocatus already, he's another brilliant build, or maybe you want to bring Karn into the picture as well for a sort of lieutenant style or a buff for your Berserkers. From there, you're going to look at things like your heavy support if you want to. So I really like running big Dreadnoughts as my heavy support options, and when I say heavy support here, I don't mean necessarily firepower, I mean like the bulky dudes that walk around and take a lot of the hits. So in a sense, Angron is one of those, but you could also look at your demon engines for that. Maybe you want to invest in something like a Lord of Skulls or Greater Brass Scorpion to really bulk out those points and have a nice centerpiece model too. Then we're going to look at things like auxiliary units. So these are kind of little things that have a specific function in your army that are going to kind of carry out a role that's set for them in the battle. So what I mean by this is things like maybe jackals that are going to come in from the side and start doing actions or something on a point, or you're going to have maybe rapier carriers drop in, hose down an enemy squad with some firepower and then probably die to give up some blood tide points, or things like chaos spawn, everyone's new favorite unit who are literally there to run around the battlefield and soak up blood tide points for you. We don't really have a crazy amount of auxiliary units available to us in the base codex right now, but again, if you're confident with your modeling skills and your painting skills, Forge World has a lot of fantastic options for auxiliary units too. Then we can also look at things like allies. Now, allies in this sense, I mean things that are not world leaders but can be included in a world leader's army. 
we have two very interesting allies option available to us. One of them is Chaos Knights. Now, this could be one very big knight. Maybe you have a big knight from an army already and you want to bring him into your world leaders. That's awesome. But the really popular option at the minute is bringing in war dogs, specifically executioners or brigands, to add a little bit of fire support that our army is lacking. Now, if you're not too interested in knights and you want to go with something more like Corn Demon Kin, you totally can. And you can bring something like Karanak and a bunch of flesh hands in a demon patrol alongside some blood blood letters. Or if you're really feeling jazzy and you're already running Angron, why not consider a phase capped Bloodthirster to jump into the mix alongside him? Given that Angron is a warp locust, he can teleport in from Angron right in front of the enemy, which is brilliant. Scarbrand can do it too. There's lots of cool options there. The skull cannons as well in the Demons book offer some really compelling fire support kit too. So demons can be really fun if you're going for a very thematic corny kind of style list. And if you've got some cool ideas for some war dogs or a big knight to kind of hang out with your world leaders, that's a great option too. Obviously, as the rules may and can change in the future, allies may become something that you can and can't do. So just be aware of that when you're starting your world leaders collection that as of time of filming, these things are legal, but as time goes on, the rules may change. So it may not be applicable. It's always worth checking and it's always worth considering before you start investing in allies for an army. So once you've kind of mastered all these things, once you have your 2k list planned out, your core is down, you're really happy with how things are going, and maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, I want to start learning how to kill main burn, how to get really good with this army. I spoke about it having a high skill ceiling, but what does that really mean? Well, a lot of it is going to involve learning the power of the movement phase. This is where a lot of our army powers up and actually wins games. It's not in the combat phase. It's about how you set up for that combat phase. So understanding when to commit your forces is a really, really important part of the world leaders. And it's something that is quite difficult to learn initially. You're not really going to visualize it until you put too many units into one combat and then all of those units get picked up in the next turn in retaliation. You need to kind of understand that drip feeding your forces can sometimes be the best way to victory. When you become familiar with the movement phase, you're going to start to master the intricacies of the combat phase and how you can break all the rules around that. Now, this is a very, very complicated topic and we're not going to spend too much time on it today. But by this, I mean understanding that when you roll your charge dice, you don't have to move directly towards the enemy model. As long as one guy ends in combat, the rest of them can move wherever they want, even onto objectives, for example. Understanding that when you select your units to fight, that you can select them in specific orders to utilize other units in combat with the same enemy unit to really maximize their pile-ins and consolidates later on to give them an extra jump in movement as well. So there's lots of small things like that and we've all done tons of videos here on the Red Path about the different tricks and tips in the combat phase. And again, I'm not gonna dive into all of it here because it's very, very complex, but understanding that mastering the combat phase and how you can move in the combat phase is really how you're going to get adept and competent with this army. As well as that, we're talking about that drip feeding as well, understanding the trade game. Like if I'm going to give you this unit of berserkers, am I getting something worthwhile back? What is the most efficient trade that can happen for the army? And then understanding when you can capitalize on situations. Has the enemy made a mistake? If they have, what am I going to put in to the fight to capitalize on that mistake? Or should I be holding some stuff back? I know I can kill maybe this deck company squad with five berserkers, so why am I putting in 10 when I could keep five of those inside the rhino and just kill the squad with half that number? So understanding these things, it's really, really crucial for getting the most out of the world leaders and maximizing the value of your units on the table. Because like I say, we are an extremely elite army now. And if you want to play it super efficiently, you have to understand that. I think it's really, really important. Again, that's respecting the value of your units. Everything we just said there, knowing that berserkers are worth 22 points a model. So you can't be trading them into your basic cultist chaff, so on and so forth. Once you understand all that, using combat as a mechanism to score victory points rather than necessarily killing your opponent, so using combat to lever leverage yourself onto objectives, to take enemies off objectives, all those things, denying victory points and gaining victory points for yourself. That is how you are going to maximize the world leaders in a competitive setting. So that is pretty much everything about getting started with the world leaders. We've talked a lot about, you know, how you're gonna get your collection started, what the best models are going to be, 
to get that collection going, how you're gonna paint it, depending on what kind of scheme you wanna do, the lore that you can immerse yourself in while you're painting, and then most importantly, how are you gonna play the world leaders on the table, which is a complicated thing. Again, like I say, easy to get into, very difficult to master. But if you wanna learn more about mastering it, here on the Red Path, we have plenty of tips and tricks. We have regular streams. We have a Discord as well that you can hop into to chat with people who are a little bit more experienced and are always happy to give you advice. There's some fantastic conversation going on there. If you want to share your new paint jobs, we've got space for that too. And of course, if you're coming up with awesome custom lore for your warbands, let us know as well in there. So you can join our Discord, sub to the channel, get those notifications going, all the usual stuff that you expect to hear from any YouTube content creator. But the main thing is, if you're getting into world leaders, have fun with this army because it is an incredibly fun army to play on the board, to paint on your desk. And more importantly, it is one of the best communities in the game to be a part of. I feel very, very lucky to be where I am with this community, to have uh, so many wonderful people hanging around. We went through some dark times in 8th edition, now we have our own book in ninth, and there's loads of wonderful new people joining. And let me tell you, we're all really excited to welcome you in to become part of the World Leaders family. Get your butcher's nails installed and start collecting those berserkers and get them cutting up the enemy. So if you have enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, give us a subscribe and please join the Discord. That's where all the good stuff happens. But until the next one, folks, stay healthy, stay safe and kill, maim, burn.